Hello and welcome back into another episode of Gamecock Central GM. I'm your host, Pearson Fowler, and with me to break down the tape of all the running backs in the 2020 draft class from GamecockCentral.com and Prep RA. As always, Will Helms. Will, how have you been doing? We're now entering the fifth week of quarantine. We know that you like to stay busy breaking down film and tutoring and doing all the things that you're doing, but are you starting to go a little stir-crazy yet? Always. Uh, I'm extroverted, so I actually had a conversation the other night with one of my friends who just called to say that he just needed to talk just because he hadn't talked enough. <laughs> um, and, and that's about where I'm getting to right now. So, um, you know, this should be good. Um, always look forward to this every week. Yeah, uh, plenty to talk about today, um, although it, it's kind of interesting. I've, I've been looking forward to this conversation, as I mentioned just a second ago, and we talked about it last time we did a podcast. We're talking about running backs. And running backs are in a very interesting position, uh, just in football in general, and especially in the NFL right now. So before we start to talk about the particulars of this draft class, you mentioned when you're looking at these things, when you're putting together your big board, you do take into consideration the value of the position as a whole, not just the value of the player. You talk about how tackles are more valuable than interior offensive linemen. And I, you know, I imagine we're going to basically go through different tendency types with all sorts of positions um, that make a player more valuable. You talked about versatility on the defensive line. Uh, just speak to your opinion about the state of the position of running back right now in the NFL. I think the easiest way to look at positional value is to look at which running back, which players at which positions um, are playing deep into the playoffs. Um, and if you look this past year, um, you just don't see a lot of first-round running backs having a lot of success as a team. Um, you've got Saquon Barkley, who's fantastic, and the Giants are terrible. You have Christian McCaffrey, who's one of the, in my opinion, Panthers fans, um, had probably two of the best running back seasons in the history of the NFL, and Panthers are terrible. Um, and so you have these players that are playing really well for really bad teams, and it's just because running backs at this point in the NFL – don't matter nearly as much as receivers, quarterbacks, even offensive linemen. Um, and I think we see that time and again with who are we looking at um, as the running backs in the um, in the uh, Super Bowl last year. We've got Raheem Mozart and um, I can't remember who the other one was. Um, two like late, late, late round guys. Doesn't mean they're bad running backs. Um, but what we'll look at when we look at positional value is running backs probably for two reasons are the second least important position in the NFL draft. Um, I guess the first reason for that is just they don't help a team as much as a quarterback does. You'd rather be able to pick up a, a slightly above average quarterback in the first round than you would an elite running back. If the Panthers had picked up, say, a pretty decent quarterback a couple of years ago, they'd be better off right now than if they'd picked up one of the best running backs in the NFL history or for, you know, obviously the first two years in Christian McCaffrey. And so it's just, if you're going to look at teams and if they take a running back in the first round, I'm not very excited about that. I actually don't have any running backs in this year's class in my top 50 overall prospects, according mm. to positional value. All right. So that makes sense. Again, given everything that we know from watching a lot of football the last couple of years, but what I always wonder when, really like overwhelming trends like these emerge. I make a lot of basketball comparisons because I watch a lot of basketball. But, you know, right now in the NBA, it's all about the three-point shot and spreading it out and playing small, and everyone's playing with centers that are six foot eight, And that's fine and good, and people are going to replicate that while it's successful. But soon enough, somebody's going to come along and be an elite big man like a Shaq type, and whether it's Joel Embiid or Nikola Jokic or whatever, and they're going to totally turn the game, you know, on, on its head, so to speak, because everyone has gone so far in the other direction, and then people are going, to, are going to be like, okay, well, we just need another elite big man to combat all these small lineups and to punish people for you know, basically playing five wings and not you know, giving up a lot on the glass and things like that. So I, I like to think about trends in that way. Do you expect like in the next five years, in the next ten years, that we will start to see, I mean, teams like the 49ers that are a, a run-first team and still play with a traditional fullback and Kyle Juszczyk, and obviously what Kyle Shanahan does just as a play designer is fantastic and, and very difficult to replicate. Um, but do you see the, this trend reversing anytime in the near future where people kind of go back to it to combat, you know, defenses maybe rolling out 
you know, basically nickel and dime packages as their base sets because they're used to people coming out and just throwing the ball. So taking advantage of, you know, smaller linebackers and, and you know, more pass rush oriented defensive linemen. Is the running back going to make a comeback in the next five or 10 years? Would you guess? I think it would be really tough um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, you're going to need just an elite, elite, elite running back to be able to do that. And if we're looking at the high school, like trickle down, um, really tr- the trickle down effect of what's happening in the NFL or the trickle up, trickle up effect, it kind of works both ways. Your elite athletes are no longer playing running back. Um, you have a guy every once in a while that comes along that plays a running back. I think of Derek Henry off the, off the bat. He's not a running back, but he plays running back and he's elite at it. Um, you know, carried it 400 times a year in high school at six foot three, um, which is just not what you see. But you see guys that are elite athletes playing quarterback, playing wide receiver, playing defensive back, um, and not really playing running back like they did 20 years ago. Um, and so I think that's having an effect of you just don't have that game-breaking running back that's coming out. And then I think it's also um, a part of NFL competition level of there's just – in college, running back still matter. You can still run the ball down somebody's throat because you, ha- you can have an elite offensive line that's just better than everybody across from them, and you can have an elite running back that's just better than everybody on the defensive side of the ball. In the NFL, it's really, really difficult to have both of those. Um, so I think of a guy like Saquon Barkley, who incredible athlete, um, incredible running back, really, really good. He just doesn't have the offensive line behind or in front of him to be able to consistently run for 100, you know, 50, 200 yards a game. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even when we think about that, um, one thing that we'll look at is, I'm, you know, I'm always a stats guy. Um, if we look at the leading rushers from last season, there was only one player um, at running back that qualified with enough carries to have more yards per carry than the worst quarterback in the league had yards per attempt. Hmm. Um, so the worst quarterback in the league in terms of yards per attempt was Mitch Trubisky, 56 out of 56 qualifying quarterbacks at 6.1 yards per completion. The only rusher that averaged more than 6.1 yards was Lamar Jackson, who isn't even a running back. <laughs> um, wow. So even if you do have that elite guy and he's getting six yards a carry, your quarterback is still probably getting seven or eight yards a pass. And so teams, I think, are going to continue to go pass first, and a lot has to change before we see that kind of shift back to the running back. Yeah, I guess the numbers don't lie in that respect, and I've never thought about it like that, which is why I'm not an NFL GM or an NFL coach or anything like that. That's that's really interesting. So I guess we'll continue to dig into those numbers with some of these guys uh, that will probably still be drafted. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll ask you that then, because I use the 49ers as an example of a team that's sort of zigging while everybody else is zagging, but it's not because they have the best running back in the league, as you mentioned. It's not, you know, Saquon Barkley or Alvin Kamara or anybody like that. The success of that offense is really contingent on Kyle Shanahan's prowess at designing plays, and I think Kyle Juszczyk is as much the linchpin of that offense as, as anything. And Raheem Mostert, I mean, didn't even really emerge until the playoffs. People didn't even know who he was. I didn't know who I didn't know his first name. I knew Mostert for the 49ers. I didn't know his first name was Raheem until the playoffs started. That's how anonymous it was. So maybe that's an even greater indictment that you can have, you know, a really really good rushing attack that is the the focal point of your offense without having an elite running back. But then, what's the point of even drafting a running back? So one of the things um, that if we look at the 49ers, and I've used them in the past as an example of a franchise I would model my franchise after if I were making a team, um, we see them spending early draft picks on defensive linemen, wide receivers, um, offensive tackles, things like that. And so their, their picks have not lined up with what their philosophy looks like. Um, but I think they're – really their offensive philosophy is not run the ball first. It's get the ball into their playmakers hands in space Mm. because they we say they run the ball a lot, but a lot of those runs are pitch plays or backwards passes or a handoff to Debo Samuel um, or something like that. And then the other thing that um, they do is they don't rely on one guy. Um, The reason we hadn't heard of Mostert a lot is because he wasn't the starting running back for most of the year. Mm -hmm. Matt Breida, um, shout out to Georgia Southern. Um, If you ever look at some college tape, it's just phenomenal. Matt Breida's. Um, I think a third or fourth round pick. um, 
played most of the year and then had a little bit of an ankle injury at the end of the year because if you play running back, you're going to get hurt at some point. Mm -hmm. Every running back plays hurt if not – if not injured, at least hurt a little bit. But if we look back at all these great running backs the 49ers have, um, have had, none of them were high draft picks. I mean, Frank Gore is probably one of the best in NFL history, um, part of that longevity. Um, but he was a third-round pick. And so you're looking at all these running backs they're using, and that's the other reason that we don't want to overdraft a running back. It's really hard to get an elite offensive tackle in the, part, in the fourth round. It's really difficult to get an elite quarterback in the fourth round. It's really hard to get an elite cornerback in the fourth round. It's really easy to get a really good running back in the third or fourth round. And that's why I always advise just waiting a little bit and taking a running back late because for every Christian McCaffrey we have that same year, I believe it was um, that same year. Yeah, that same year we have, um, who was it? Chris Carson picked as the second to last uh, running back in the league. Um, or in the draft at 249th overall um, and was third in the league in rushing last year. Mm. So you've got a couple of these like really high draft picks and they can be really good running backs, but you also have that, um, that um, opportunity cost of, yeah, you took a running back, but who else could you have taken at that pick? Um, again, I go back to the Panthers. The Panthers took Christian McCaffrey eight, who he wasn't even the first running back picked that draft. It was, Leonard Fournette, but if the Panthers had picked um, one of the quarterbacks that had come out that draft, um, it would have made them a better team, better franchise than where they are right now. Where are they right now? Well, they're they're having to rebuild everything, um, trying to follow the 49ers and getting a good quarterback through either trade or free agency. Um, most of the time we don't see that because most of them want to be on the rookie contracts. But that's the other thing is once a running back gets into their fifth year, um, we'll see their fifth year picked up, but most of them don't get re-signed because you can pick up a younger guy for a lot cheaper in the draft who can be just as good, if not, you know, serviceable. And so I think, you know, um, Christian McCaffrey is an exception because he's such a good receiver as well. But if the Panthers re-sign him, I think it's a huge mistake because you're re-signing him for money that you could spend on more important positions that are more difficult to find playmakers. Whereas you can find a guy that might not be quite as good as Christian McCaffrey, but can do, do more than good enough to help the offense, and you can spend that money on a wide receiver or spend that money on a defensive back or a defensive end or something like that. And that's where I think um, the 49ers are some of the best in the league. Of uh, they, they draft a lot of defensive linemen, and then they fill holes um, where they need to through, through trade, through the draft. Um, I, I thought the move they made a couple, years, uh, a couple weeks ago was – excellent when they traded the Colts. I think it was um, DeForest Buckner was one of those defensive linemen they picked, but they stocked up on defensive linemen, realized they didn't need one, traded once the Colts and picked up a first-round pick, and they definitely won't pick up a running back in the first round. Mm. They'll pick up um, some sort of position of value um, in this draft, probably a corner, maybe off the tackle, um, something like that, um, to add more depth and more talent at the important positions on their team. I think this could probably end up doubling as a fantasy football podcast once we get back around to the fall because it's always conventional wisdom that you draft a running back first, you know, Saquon Barkley, Christian McCaffrey type. Maybe Christian McCaffrey's still worth drafting early because of all the receptions, especially if you're in a PPR league. But as someone that had Matt Breida this year and, he, you know, he was good and he was on and off. And by the way, like my league has at least switched to one running back, which is great because for a while it was two running backs and that's just too many. But you know, Breida goes down, and I think he missed maybe another game earlier in the season, and you go and you pick someone up off the waiver wire, waiver wire and by and large, it doesn't make a difference. You just kind of have to be lucky with a guy scoring a touchdown that week or not. But um, I, I guess the, the rare time that our actual educated conversation about football intersects with fantasy. Uh, but to the point about McCaffrey, and I guess to sort of segue into this group of guys now, the running back position has become as much about what you can do catching the ball out of the backfield as what you can do running the ball between the tackles. Le'Veon Bell kind of paved the way for this a couple years ago when he demanded to be paid as the high, as, as one of the best wide receivers in the league plus one of the best running backs in the league. And we see a lot more guys being used like that, and those are, frankly, the more valuable guys. You know, Kamara's great, but part of the reason Kamara's great is because you can use him catching the ball out of the backfield. Same with Christian McCaffrey. I mean, you go down the list, and there aren't a lot of guys that are just running between the tackles. So when I look at your big board here, your first three guys, Jonathan Taylor, DeAndre Swift, J.K. Dobbins, 
Are those in order of these guys are the best running backs at running the football, or does Jonathan Taylor off, also offer the most versatility? And actually, I guess if I can back up a little bit before you answer that, uh, I guess can you explain sort of your methodology? How, how much do you val- uh, value you know, route running out of the backfield, pass catching out of the backfield, yards after catch, things like that when you're considering these lists? So I value it a lot. Um, pretty obviously, I'm a big pass first guy. Um, I don't think it's as difficult to find somebody that can run in between the tackles. And so you don't want to pick somebody in the first round, second round, that is just going to run up between the tackles because you can find anybody that can do that. And we might praise those guys and say, yeah, they're, they're playing really well. Um, I think of a guy like Josh Jacobs last year. I like Josh Jacobs. Um, had a really good year for the Raiders. But the reason he had such a good year is because they let him have a good year. They could have done the same thing with a fifth-round draft pick and just been fine. Um, and so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for versatility. I'm looking for three-down running back. And when we say three-down, it means they don't have any inherent flaws in their game and pass protection um, in running the ball or in catching the ball out of the backfield. So they can play at any point in the game. You don't want to have a guy that a really good running back that just can't block at all. And then you just can't have him in the game for third down because he can't offer any sort of blitz pickup or anything like that. So we're looking for some of those things. Um, and then more so than the other positions, I care less about where a guy plays, who his competition was against, and more about, with a couple exceptions here and there, how did they look in college? If they look good in college, they'll probably look good in the pros. It's just the way it's been for years. If you look at um, the guys that have been the, the best players, um, the best running backs in the NFL, they excelled in college. Um, and they maybe didn't have the accolades coming out of the draft. Maybe they didn't have a great combine or something like that. But most of the time, if you just look and compare NFL stats of some of the best guys in the league to college stats of some of the best guys in the league, they line up pretty well. Um, yeah, I mentioned Matt Breida earlier. He fell just because he played in a triple option offense at Georgia Southern. But you could tell by watching him at Georgia Southern, he was going to be an NFL running back. Mm. Um, And so I look a lot at what did they do in college? I don't expect, again, with a couple exceptions, we'll have one major exception um, coming up in just a little bit. Um, But if they were good in college, they'll probably be good in the pros. If they weren't good in college, they probably won't be good in the pros. And so that's my number one thing that I'm looking at. And then I'm just looking for, do you offer something unique? Um, that would vault you above some of the other running backs. Because, again, if you take a running back in the third round, they don't work out, it's okay, go pick another one next year, and that guy might work out. Um, So we're looking for high upside and opportunities for big plays um, or just really opportunities to find some sort of role on an offense, especially with teams doing so many sub packages these years. We can look for guys that maybe – won't play but 20 snaps a game, but can be huge assets to their team. I think of, uh, you mentioned use check earlier. Um, as a fullback, most people aren't picking fullbacks, but he's more of a tight end than a fullback. Um, and they, the 49ers picked him, had a plan, and used him and continued to use him exceptionally well. And so he's become one of the best, full, probably the best fullback in the league, um, even though he doesn't play every down. Um, so we're just looking for guys that can offer us just a little bit something extra from somebody else. Um, And then we're just looking for what made them good in college and will that translate to the pros? Um, The example I always use is Johnny Manziel, obviously not running back, but his number one asset in college is that if something didn't go right, he could just run around and eventually find somebody. And when you get to the NFL, that just doesn't translate as well as the skill of being accurate or, um, you know, having a good deep ball or something like that. And so at running back, are we looking for guys, if we're looking um, at guys and they make get all of their yardage in college by dancing around and just outrunning everybody, they're probably not going to be able to do that in the NFL when every defensive end is as fast as they are. Um, so we're looking for guys, can they, um, are they good at one cut? Um, so can they make a cut and move up field and go? Um, I look for acceleration. Don't really care as much about top-end speed, so I don't care that much about 40-yard dash. Um, anything like that, I'm more concerned about acceleration and what you offer in the passing game, both as a blocker and a receiver. Are you still looking at their actual ability to run the football first and foremost, or would you say at this point, the way the football is played, that pass catching and pass protection, just the entirety of the passing game from the running back position, is more important than running the football when you're evaluating these guys? 
this might be a controversial statement, but I think you can teach basically anybody to run the football. Um, so even if you're not very polished as a running back, per se, in between the tackles, what was the thing on Christian McCaffrey coming out? He couldn't run the ball up the middle, and obviously he can do that. If you've got the athleticism, you can learn how to run the ball up the middle or um, play a different scheme. It's not as difficult at running back to change schemes as it would be as a quarterback or as a wide receiver or um, offensive lineman or something like that. Um, so when I'm evaluating, I'm looking more at athleticism because I feel fairly confident that most of these guys, even if they're not the most polished running back, can learn how to run with better pad level, can learn how to um, accelerate through the hole or it, different things like that. Um, they can be taught that. And so anything that we can be taught that might drop your draft position because you're not as good at that, but you can learn it is something we're looking for. We want anything that's going to drop a guy's um, value per se and that we can very easily as a team would be able to elevate um, and kind of take that flaw away. And that more so than a lack of acceleration or um, one of the things that I, I will say that is very difficult is it's hard to teach a guy how to find the hole the example for that would be Trent Richardson is probably the worst in NFL history at that. He had everything physically <laughs> and just could not find out how to run the ball through um, somewhere that was not filled with defenders. Um, he didn't really have the best opposite lineman. Of course, he played for Cleveland for the, most of his early career, uh, but he was just horrible at it. And it ended up in a, I think, 3.2 yards per carry career average. Um, just could never figure out how to actually run the ball where he's supposed to run the ball. Um, and so that's hard to teach, um, but we are looking for things that we can – a guy may struggle with, but that we can easily teach. And we can't teach acceleration. We can't t uh, teach cutting ability. Uh, we can't teach kind of feel for uh, finding a hole, and we can't teach um, a lot of how to make guys miss in the open field. So when you're looking at this list, I guess none of the guys have probably that huge – flaw like they just can't find the hole or anything like that so what we're looking at now is you got a list of 15 guys for me here and just as a quick aside maybe similar to the defensive line and again if you're talking about athleticism and upside it would make sense that the guys with the best athletes out of high school are the best or the best athletes coming out of high school are also the best athletes coming out of college which is why you see this list is mostly power five school you got wisconsin georgia ohio state florida state lsu arizona state utah uh, you do have Appalachian State here. South Carolina saw them. Not a Power Five, but you know an FBS school. Uh, you have Memphis. You have Maryland. And then if I flip over to the next page, you have Boston College, Memphis, uh, South Carolina, Cincinnati, and Arizona State. So Arizona. is is that the uh, is that the kind of a similar thing that's going on with the defensive lineman here, where you're looking for upside, so you're looking for athletes, and the guys that were most highly recruited coming out of high school because they were the best athletes are kind of in the same position coming out of college. Not necessarily, um, but this year the running back position just trends more than usual towards Power 5 schools. Um, the, it, you could very easily, if we're looking back, um, I've got the history of the draft pulled up here. We've got some Florida Atlantic last year. Um, a lot of Power 5 schools, a lot of D1 schools. I don't think there was a single D2 um, guy picked last year. Um, you got two guys from Florida Atlantic picked last year. Um, we don't really see. Yeah, the past couple of years, um, we got a guy from Fordham a couple of years ago, um, but mostly does trend a little bit towards Power Five. But most of the time, it does tend to trend towards Power Five, just because that's where most of the talent is. Mm. Um, this year it is a little bit heavier with um, top end talent. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about rivals ratings for a couple of these guys, and a lot of them are like top ten recruits. Um, so. This year in particular, it skews a little bit more towards the Power Five. Um, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't like some guys from smaller schools, per se. It's just that this year, doesn't really, there aren't really any small school guys that wow me at the running back position. So is Jonathan Taylor the best running back in this class, or is he the running back with the highest upside based on how the NFL game is played? In my opinion, both. Um, I've seen DeAndre Swift in person. He's kind of the trendier pick right now for the number one running back. I've seen a couple of people put J.K. Dobbins at number one. I particularly like Jonathan Taylor. Um, the, it used, in my opinion, NFL scouting has not caught up to the times in a couple ways. 
And one of those things is it still looked at um, workhorse as a negative. If you ran the ball a lot in college, it means, oh, you don't have as much, um, you know, you have more wear and tear than some of these other guys that didn't run the ball a lot. But you're not seeing running backs last 10, 12 years anyway. Um, so if you see running backs that are really going to last their prime is the first five years. We don't care how much they ran the ball in college. And that's one of the drawbacks to Jonathan Taylor is he touched the ball so many times in college. I think over 300 times a year the past three or four years at Wisconsin, um, which is maybe pushing some scouts and teams away. But if we're looking at Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry touched the ball 400 times, eight straight years, and he's still playing fine. Um, and, yeah, he will get worn out eventually. But Jonathan Taylor doesn't have those issues like, say, a Todd Gurley with his knees or something like that, where Todd Gurley is being paid by the Rams to not play for the Rams because his knees are so messed up. Mm. We don't have an issue with that uh, with Jonathan Taylor. He's got good size. He's got good stats, good tape. We love his um, stats and tape. Everybody did. But I don't think people expected him to have the combine he did. It was kind of like a, we were expecting him almost to have – I would say actually in a very similar way to Debo Samuel last year, where a lot of people saw the stats, saw the tape, knew that he was going to be good, but weren't expecting him to go and just um, excel at the combine. And then he did, and he shoots up draft boards because that's the one thing that people were not expecting. And he, I think he ran in the low four fives, maybe four fours. Um, might have to look that up in just a second. Um, but good bench press, uh, good shuttle times. We're always looking at acceleration, stuff like that. And he's coming from a um, school in Wisconsin that tends to put out good running backs. Um, so we really like him. I would say if I were going to lean to pick somebody late in the first round, he would be the only one of our top four that I would take maybe take in the um, first round. Later in the first round, um, and only if my team has everything else, so I think a team like the Chiefs, they could really benefit from another running back um, just because they've got most everything else. Hmm. Um, or maybe another team that, that's really solid that can, is kind of filling a hole here and there with running back but is not missing out on anything else, um, any other dynamic player in a position of need because they're, they're pretty fine um, all over. You wouldn't want to see a team like the um, – you know, like the – the Jaguars, or um, I'm trying to think of bad teams with not good running backs. Um, you know, any of those top 10 teams, you don't really want to see them pick up a running back because there are too many other important holes that they're missing. Um, but Jonathan Taylor's a guy who's got catch out of backfield ability. He can block. Um, maybe a little limited route tree, but if you're not expecting him to go play out in the slot and be that kind of hybrid guy, you don't need him to be able to run 12 different kinds of routes. You just need to be able to, to have him be a safety net, get him involved in open field and let him run. Um, and we just don't see any flaws in his take. Um, so he's not going to offer that Christian McCaffrey, just absolutely any play. He could be gone kind of um, wow potential, but he's going to be a really, really, really solid kind of can't miss running back prospect. What separates Jonathan Taylor from, I mean, you're making it sound like he's in a group sort of by himself here. I don't know what the cutoff for the next group is. DeAndre Swift, J.K. Dobbins, Cam Akers, and Clyde edwards are the next four guys on the list. And I'll just say now, spoiler, CEH was my favorite running back in college football last year. I know you were a big fan of his as well, and we'll talk about him in just a minute. But wherever you cut off the second group, what's the gap between Taylor and that next group? So I think there's not a huge gap between Taylor and, say, DeAndre Swift. Or I, I've got it kind of in the top four of um, Taylor Swift, uh, Taylor Swift, huh? um, Dobbins and Akers in kind of that top group. Um, DeAndre Swift, to me, is just not quite as good as some of the other Georgia running backs that have come out the past couple of years. And I think he's being boosted a little bit by where he played in college, which at running back is pretty good is pretty important. You're going to see guys that constantly come out of the same schools. Um, but DeAndre Swift is just not at the level of a Nick Chubb or a Todd or healthy Todd Gurley, or even going back even further, no Sean Marino um, or some of those guys. I just don't think he's quite as good. And I think he's being, he's getting a little bit of the benefit of the doubt being from, um, from Georgia. He's not quite as fast. He doesn't have quite as good acceleration. Um, 
pretty interesting. Um, NFL.com put an NFL comparison, Frank Gore, um, to him, which I like Frank Gore. But if somebody's comparing somebody to Frank Gore coming out of the draft, it doesn't make me go, wow, that's a, that's a guy I really, really want. Mm. It sounds to me like he's, he's going to be a solid running back. He's going to be a starter for a team, but he just doesn't excite me as much as a Jonathan Taylor um, or even potentially J.K. Dobbins. So I'm looking at uh, at the list of – I went back to your offensive linemen and the fact that he's playing – he being Swift played with a bunch of guys that are going to be in the NFL. I mean, uh, three to five of those offensive linemen are going to be in the NFL, uh, two or three of them this year. I, I can't remember. I know, uh, obviously, um, Andrew Thomas is going to be uh, a very high pick. And then uh, as, uh, was Isaiah Wilson, is he the other one? Yes, uh, Isaiah yeah. Wilson and then there's underclassmen that are – going to be there eventually too yeah yeah so he's running behind uh, essentially an nfl offensive line does he get points for that because we've seen what it looks like for him to run behind those kinds of bodies and we have a a reasonable way of predicting how productive he's going to be or does he lose points for that because you say well that offensive line was so much better than most of the defensive lines that he played we expect that production to sort of be dialed back when he is going up against better defensive lines so I'm going to pull an advanced stat out, and I don't have it offhand, so um, I'm hoping this is makes sense enough. But there's an advanced stat called line yards um, in college, and it tries to – it's kind of rudimentary in a couple ways, kind of a little basic, um, based more on just stats than it is on film of any sort, um, which, as we've talked about before, I don't love. I want to base my stats on film. But there's a thing called line yards, and line yards basically says that it, it attributes how many of the rushing yards should be given to the offensive line. Um, so is a guy, you know, walking untouched for six yards before he gets tackled, or is he getting tackled in the backfield? And it looks at things like how often a guy gets tackled or a team gets tackled in the backfield, how often um, – how the average distance downfield that the running back hits um, – gets hit by a defender for the first time. Um, and then it looks at what percentage of your yards come on big plays versus small plays. So if you get five yards of carry every single carry, it's going to attribute that more to the offensive line than it is to the running back because it's going to say, okay, the running back's getting about four yards downfield then falling forward every single time. If they're getting five yards of carry because they have one-yard rush, one-yard rush, two-yard rush, 50-yard rush, They're going to give that to the running back, kind of that old Barry Sanders um, playing behind not a very good offensive line, but he could break it at any point, and that's what made his stats so good. They're going to give that to the running back. And Georgia and Wisconsin, I believe, were the um, number one and number two teams in the country at that. Um, Again, pretty basic stat, um, but kind of telling that that was – you know, that, that they do play behind elite offensive, line, uh, offensive linemen. But one of the interesting things there is we look at acceleration at that point because um, the NFL did actually a data called the Big Data Bowl. Mm-hmm. And some random college students who have never watched football before um, won on a data point finding out that according to the NFL draft, the number one thing that tells um, how good a running back will be is how fast they are running at the line of scrimmage. Hmm. So if they're running faster at the line of scrimmage, they're going to get further down the field. If they're running slower at the line of scrimmage, they're going to get less far down the field. Um, And so that's why we're looking at acceleration, but we're also looking at, you know, we do care a little bit about those offensive linemen and how much they help, but ultimately we can tell from the film of a running back how much a running back is doing, and offensive linemen are not going to win every play, so we're going to see what happens when an offensive lineman gets off schedule. I think about um, one of the things, the only time I've seen DeAndre Swift this year in person was the South Carolina-Georgia game, and Javon Kinlaw did not really give DeAndre Swift much of a chance to show NFL scouts anything in that game because Kinlaw was consistently almost every single play in the backfield. Um, And so because of that, DeAndre Swift couldn't do anything. Um, Didn't wow me as much. Um, he had some off games, and Jonathan Taylor didn't. And so, again, we're going, I guess you could call it a little bit of upside. Um, but I, um, 
I really, really like Jonathan Taylor and the overall versatility he brings. Not saying DeAndre Swift won't be as good, um, but I just don't love him as much, especially in the in the um, range where they're expected to be drafted. I think you can find another DeAndre Swift in the third or fourth round. I don't know if you can find another Jonathan Taylor in the third or fourth round. I want to keep pulling on this thread since you mentioned it, and it's interesting. Some of the advanced stats that you all look at, obviously the offensive line, or the, the line yard, that's what they call it, line yards? Line yards, yeah. Line yards. Okay, so between line yards, whatever your speed is at the line of scrimmage, I don't know if there's a name for that or a particular way of, of you know, calculating that or whatever. What are some of the other advanced metrics, the things that, you, that you're using to supplement just watching films on these running backs, maybe outside of just the traditional pro football focus numbers, if there is anything else that you use, uh, again, to sort of supplement your opinions of these guys? So um, I think I said earlier, I don't care as much about 40-yard dash. Um, somebody, I, I used to be, when I was like 15 years old, really big into the combine. Um, just from a surface level, I like seeing the guys run the draft or run the, um, run the 40. I like seeing guys do all the drills and things like that, but I didn't know what I was looking for. And somebody pointed out to me that the 40-yard dash is the most useless thing in football um, because if you th- look in the history of the NFL, um, I believe the player with the most 40-yard runs is Barry Sanders in the history of the NFL. Um, and I think he had 19 in his career. Um, in a, like a 10 year career. What? Wow. So like 19 times in his career, the, the best ever at it reached 40 yards. And of those 40 yard runs, probably 10 of them didn't involve a straight line running 40 yards downfield. Mm-hmm. So I don't care that much about a 40 yard run. Um, if it happens great, let's say a guy runs a four, six versus a four, four, that means he might get tackled five yards sooner than the guy that runs the four, four. Um, so overall, let's say, let's say we have two running backs and they last 15 years and they break Barry Sanders number. The one that runs a four, six might be worse off for five yards on 19 carries across an entire career. I don't care that much about it. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I do look at um, that they don't really broadcast as much is I look at the first 10 yards. And if you look at the first 10 yards of the 40 and some of the shuttle drills, you'll start to see that the guys that are the best at that are the guys that are best in the NFL at any skill position. Um, One of the best last year in the NFL was Debo Samuel. He didn't wow. I think he ran a 4.49, 4.48, which for a receiver his size, decent. he's more of a running back size-wise than a receiver, um, but doesn't wow you. But his first 10 was incredible. And that's what jumped off the page to a lot of teams like 49ers because they say, oh, he can, work in, you know, he can work in small spaces because he has that acceleration. If you think about you know, a wide receiver, you catch a slant route, it doesn't matter how fast you eventually get to if you get tackled as soon as you catch it. Mm. It does matter if you can get away from a guy in the first three yards. If you can get away from a guy in the first three yards, then that's going to give you more yardage than if you eventually get up to speed. And so you've got guys like Jonathan Taylor, uh, J.K. Dobbins. Um, Edward Solaire actually has pretty good acceleration. You know, Benjamin, um, a lot of these guys further down the list can get through the hole quickly. And what that will do is it turns a lot of would-be full-on tackles into arm tackles, and it's a lot easier to break. And it doesn't have anything to do with power. It has to do with how quickly can you get to your spot. And so I'm looking for acceleration. Um, I, that's not really an advanced stat. I think of that more of like a Madden, like what's your acceleration number? Um, <laughs> right. But it is yeah, but if you're looking at like the splits, make... if you're looking like your first 10 meter splits in the 40 meter dash, like I, I would qual- I would qualify that as sort of an, an advanced measure or sort of a next level thing to be looking for. Uh, do you happen to know offhand? I don't want to put you on the spot, and you, if you don't have it, you don't need to go find it. But do you happen to know who had the fastest first 10 meters of the 40 meter dash of these guys? I do not have that. Um, I wish I did. Um, but it's not something that they really advertise that much. They'll right. say it on the, the combine day, and then they just won't put it anywhere, like online, which is frustrating. Um, but, um, you know, I wish they did. But a lot of that, actually, you can see on film, too. And right. so I, I try to see when are defenders taking bad angles. And usually when a defender's taking a bad angle, it's not because they're 
a bad defender, it's because they underestimated the speed or the running back got to full speed faster than um, they were expected to get to. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at is, you know, if I've got a guy that just stands out on film as being able to um, get to his spot a little bit more quickly than you would expect, um, that's something that's can, I think it is undervalued in the NFL, um, but consistently just shows up among the best players in the NFL. And I honestly, we break up this scouting into all of these advanced metrics and all these advanced, um, I guess, methods of methodologies and trying to find these things. I still think the easiest thing to do is take the top 10 players at a position in the NFL and say, okay, what do they do well? And if all these guys do this well, then can we find guys in the draft that also do this well? Because that obviously translates. Um, And if we're looking at running backs, that's what they're the best at. Um, Christian McCaffrey isn't the fastest running back in the league, but you'd be hard pressed to find somebody with better acceleration, um, especially at, in and out of cut. If you can make a cut and be back up to full speed um, versus if you make a cut and it takes you 15 yards to get back up to where you were before you cut. So I've seen some people that have JK Dobbins as the best or number one running back in the draft for those that think that, what do they think that he does better? Ah, oh, man, I have the hiccups, and I've been trying to not hiccup into the mic, and I just hiccup into the mic. It's all right. All right, so what, people that love J.K. Dobbins, what do they think he does better than Taylor or Swift, or is it just a matter of estimating upside? I think it's estimating upside. Um, he didn't have a great junior year, or I, I can't remember if he was a junior. He didn't have a great 2018. Um, it was an okay year. wasn't amazing. Um I mean, second, I think it was, what, second team all Big Ten? That was 2000, uh, 2017. Um, yeah, it just was okay um, in 2018. And so a lot of people were like, okay, is this, which guy are we looking at? I think one thing is if you look at the advanced metrics, if you look at the stats, if you look at the PFF numbers, he's not going to be as good as um, Jonathan Taylor or DeAndre Swift. But if you look at where he's, excelling he's not racking up yardage against fcs teams he's not playing you know max teams and running for 300 yards he racked up i think half of his yardage against wisconsin um clemson and penn state last year i think or michigan one of those two teams so he he racked up i think almost 700 yards against those three teams um which that's one of the things that that you really really like to see the other thing is he just looks chiseled. He's just a big dude, but strong. He just looks like a football player. Um, he didn't play, run at the draft or at the combine, which for me, I don't care about the combine that much. But when you turn in a performance like Jonathan Taylor had, which was not expected, I looked up his combine number when we were looking. He ran a four three nine. That mm-hmm. wasn't expected at all. Um, it just, I think, puts him a little bit above J.K. Dalvin's. But really, these first three, I really like. I don't, still don't like them in the first round, but I think they're great second-round running back options. Is their success as contingent on landing in the right spot? You, you mentioned you know, for, de, uh, for defensive linemen, obviously depending on what scheme you're going to play, what coaches are going to ask you to do. And, like, yeah, it, it, obviously if you get a good coach, it's going to be good. If you get a bad coach, it's going to be bad. But is, I, I guess, the type of offense that a team runs as important in terms of drafting running backs, like thinking about where they're going to be successful? I think it actually kind of goes the opposite way in the sense of it's not hard to install some running plays that your new guy is good at. Um, So if you've got a guy that's a one cut runner, meaning he's running laterally, he kind of picks his hole, cuts up fields and runs. It's not hard to put a stretch play or that old LSU inside toss play into your playbook. It's not that hard to teach offensive linemen to run that play and you can run, you know, maybe six new plays and play to the strengths of your guy versus saying, okay, this is the scheme that we run. Let's, let's pick a new guy because the point of picking a running back is more so than other positions. You don't want a running back that mirrors your backup running back. A quarterback, you want your backup quarterback to be the same exact thing as your starting quarterback because you don't want your quarterback to get hurt and you have to completely change your offense. At running back, you kind of want guys with contrasting styles, and you want to tailor your playbook 
to what they excel at. So it's not very hard for a coach to say, wow, we ended up with, I think about the 49ers, and the 49ers, yes, had some forethought to, to pick up Debo Samuel. But they picked up Debo Samuel and said, hey, we want to use him as a running back. Um, and, and obviously we'll use him as a receiver too. But they put a ton of plays, and we saw all throughout the year, that were designed around Debo Samuel, not around this guy that we might draft. And if we end up with a guy that fits these plays that we really like, he's the guy we're going to go with. They picked uh, Debo Samuel and said, okay, we love what he can do. Let's put some stuff in our playbook that he can excel at. And I think in, with a running back, it's kind of the same thing. It's not very hard to say, okay, we want to throw a couple stretch plays in here. We've never run stretch plays before, but we've got this guy that's a good one cut runner or We've got a really small running back that runs outside the tackles. We're going to run up in, uh, in between the tackles a lot with this bigger guy that we've picked up. Um, I don't think it's that hard to be able to do. Um, and then ultimately, I think a lot of times when you get a guy like J.K. Dobbins or uh, Jonathan Taylor that just excel in the open field, it's not hard to say, okay, the goal of this play is just to get him the ball and let him run. Mm. Um, whether that's a pitch play, a screen, um, you know, just kind of an outlet, you know, uh, swing route or something like that. A lot of times it is very similar, and it's just can we get the guy at the ball in open space? Um, and so it's it's not hard to add those things to kind of answer your question. So I I wouldn't really care if I were a team. They might fall in love with a couple guys, but I don't think that all of those guys are going to look the exact same. I think you fall more in love with the player um, himself, and then you tailor your you know where you go from there to that player versus saying, okay, we need a, a running back that fits this, this, and this, um, and that's what we're going to do. And, and there are exceptions to that. Like if you need a, a power back, you're going to find a power back in the later rounds and say, okay, we needed a power back because we have a speed back to pair them together. We'll see that too. Uh, but overall, I think they fall in love with the player and then kind of change what they're doing to fit that player's skill set. Cam Akers from Florida State is the first guy outside of, you know, that kind of top three that you identified that you like all those guys, Taylor Swift and Dobbins. Is Aker the first guy on the list with sort of a glaring weakness, or, or what else would separate him from those other three guys? I actually, and I'm the only person I know that has done this, I put him up there with those three. Um, I call it the Willie Taggart effect of we can overlook bad coaching, if it's really, really bad coaching, there was just something going on in the program. We actually kind of look at that as a benefit because it's something that drops him down without dropping his ability down. Um, Cam Akers off the top of my head was the number two overall recruit, maybe number three overall recruit by rivals a couple of years ago. I think Najee Harris was the number one that year. Um, chose over uh, Florida state over Alabama, partially because Najee Harris went to Alabama. Um, and, showed flashes his freshman year and then just never had a quarterback, never had an offensive line, really never had an offensive line, never had a defense, never had any playmakers on the outside and just kind of got lost. Um, and so he still has that NFL potential that he had in high school. Um, and I just don't think we see it as much in the stats, but we see flashes on tape. And so to me, if you pair this guy with just a better situation, I think he's way better than what he played in college. So is he the biggest opinion, unknown in this group of even, let's say, these, these first 10 just because the team that he was on was so bad? Absolutely. Um, you, you can look at, I mean, Jonathan Taylor, nobody's looking at Jonathan Taylor and going, well, you know, we, we don't really know if we saw it on tape or in the stats or, um, you know, in some of the advanced metrics. We, we just don't really know if we saw it. Everybody goes, okay, Jonathan Taylor, Heisman contender. We saw it week in and week out. They look at DeAndre Swift, and they go, yeah, we, we see it week in and week out. Um, DeAndre Swift made Jake Fromm look a lot better than Jake Fromm actually is. Um, again, week in and week out. Uh, J.K. Dobbins played really, really well against some really good competition. And then you got Cam Akers up there that's like, well, the potential's there, but you never hit it. And so there is potential for bust there of, well, maybe he just de doesn't actually have the potential. We, we think he does, and we've tricked ourselves into thinking that this big fast guy um, that played so well in high school is going to magically be stay this big fast guy that plays well in the NFL. Um, but I, I do think it's one of those things that you see guys all the time that get traded to a new team and just become so much better. And the old team's going, well, what happened to this guy? Like, why was he not good? Um, and I think Florida state 
is an example of that. Is they were so bad last year um, against not great competition, to be honest, because the ACC wasn't that great last year. Um, and Cam Akers flashed potential. There were a couple games. I think he had a 200-yard rushing game where people were like, what just happened there? And then they stopped running the ball with him. Um, and that's completely off the top of my head. I'll look it up real quick. Um, but, yeah, last year ended up with almost 1,200 rushing yards, averaged five yards a carry. Um, doesn't really offer that much, um, you know, in the return. Doesn't do a lot of return, um, return game, anything like that. But he did run, have at least 150 carries every year. And he wasn't bad, per se. It's just that he played on a bad team and didn't really live up to the five-star hype that he had. We like five-star guys that don't live up to the hype because a lot of times they'll play like a four-star since they were a five-star guy. Just people, for whatever reason, the perception is that they weren't good. Um, And so we're looking last year. um, Yeah, so um, he had a stretch of 20 carries for 144 yards and four touchdowns against uh, Syracuse. 30 carries for 157 yards and a touchdown against Wake Forest. Plays Clemson the next week and gets nine touches the entire game. Um, 34 yards in that game. But then comes back and has 100-yard games in five of the la- or four of the last five games of the year. Um, so he just wasn't used well in college. Um, kind of the opposite of the, the workhorse thing. Of You want him to be a workhorse, and he wasn't. Um, and so I think that the flaws that are pushing him down the board for a lot of people aren't as big as what you would think. And again, if we're a GM, we want to look for guys that other teams think have flaws, but don't really have flaws that make a difference. Cause there are flaws that make a difference and make you not as good of a player in the NFL. And then there are flaws that just cause people to kind of throw you down the board that don't actually exist. It sounds um, that could like be an off-field issue that isn't really an off-field issue or something like that. Yeah, this this could be a, a really interesting kind of test case or maybe player to watch to see how different teams operate philosophically because I, I feel like this will be end up being a big discrepancy between big board and mock draft and real draft where he could very easily end up being one of the best four running backs in the draft, but just because of the un, uncertainties, he could maybe be the seventh or eighth or ninth or tenth running back taken and not taken until maybe even the fourth, fifth, Sixth round, is that fair to say? Absolutely. Um, I would probably say third round is about – I would see somebody taking taking a chance on him third round. But he could go very – I could see him going in the 40s or 50s, um, especially if there is a run on running backs um, in the early rounds. It's going to be really interesting in this draft to see where the dominoes start to fall because the wide receiver class is so deep. The defensive line class is so deep. Uh, do you see guys say, well, we can get a quality wide receiver in the third, fourth, fifth round? Um, when we talk about wide receivers, we'll talk about there are some second-round wide receivers that are going to go in the fifth round just because of pure volume. Um, so are there going to be teams that look and go, well, we can find a guy at that position later, but we're not going to be able to find a Cam Akers later. Let's take him in the second round. So I think you could see that. Hmm. All right, the next guy up, I mean, this is – why I wanted to talk about running backs. I just want to spend some time talking about how awesome Clyde Edwards Alaire is and maybe be a little bit sad that he's probably not going to be as good in the NFL as he was in college, but he was my favorite running back last year. He's like a fire hydrant on wheels and the uh maybe in the semifinal game, I don't remember, he ripped off a really long touchdown run towards the end of the season. The football season feels like it was a lifetime ago, so I can't remember what specifically it was, but I just remember thinking, a guy built like that should not be able to move that quickly, and yet there he goes. That dude is just awesome. If it's the one I'm thinking of, he also did that on a bad knee, um, which is just, I mean, he's, when we're looking at film, he's the one that you go, ooh, okay, I like him. I really, really like him. And, And I think you're right. He's not going to be that, every down not that he couldn't be i just don't see him being an every down um kind of wide receiver or, you know wide receiver running back hybrid that a lot of teams are going towards um but he is going to be really really good for a team that knows how to use him and he's not going to be if we're talking you know we get into fantasy he's not going to be your i want to take this guy in the first round of my fantasy draft because he's going to touch the ball 40 times a game and you know score 30 touchdowns this season, but he is going to be used 
strategically by a team. He's a bowling ball. I mean, he's 5'7", 210, um, which, again, running back, we don't care if the guy's super short. Um, we'll talk about a couple guys later that are. Um, but we really – he's polished. He looks like an NFL running back. The one issue I have that isn't really an issue that really just kind of defines him more as a role player kind of one-two punch guy versus, like, the only running back on a team, um, he seeks out, in my opinion, seeks out contact too often. Um, there are a lot of times I think that he is elusive enough where he could just kind of run around somebody and get an extra 10 yards, but he would rather run over somebody and get an extra five yards, mm-hmm. which there is a place for that in the NFL. Um, and so I love, love Clyde Edwards Flair. I just don't think that he is going to be – you don't want to pick a running back really, really early. That's going to be kind of a situational, maybe plays 30, 40 snaps a game versus 60 snaps a game. You don't want to take a guy like that as the first running back overall. Um, right, and I've, I've accepted that for him. Like that. Yeah, which is, which is again, it, it makes me sad, but – he's someone that I feel like is just good to have on your team for the reason that you just mentioned, like his willingness to seek out contact, to be physical. I feel like he is your quintessential. And and look, I I agree with you completely. I don't think he's going to be a bell cow back for an NFL team. At least not a good NFL team, but there is there. I think there's more value than just if he plays 30 snaps a game and gets like eight to 12 carries and catches a pass or two. I feel like the impact that he has just as an energy guy, as a tone setter could be, I mean, just, I mean, like, worth the value of him as a player. Well, also, if we're looking at it, again, when's the last time we had a bell cow back lead a team to the Super Bowl? Mm. Every team the, that's been in the Super Bowl the past few years, I mean, Todd Gurley's the only one I can think of, and he was hurt the whole postseason. Right. Every team the past couple of years, we think about, like, who are the best, if we look statistically, who are the best running backs in the NFL? They were all Ravens. They're like the top four rushers statistically were part of the Ravens. And so they all have their defined role and it just constantly, they switch them in and out and it really, really puts pressure on the defense. I think a perfect fit, just an absolutely perfect fit for Edward Solaire would be the New England Patriots. They already have uh, Sonny Michelle. I like Sonny Michelle a lot. Maybe has a knee injury concern. We'll see about that. I think pairing him with a Sony Michelle would just be awesome. I think that would be exactly what the Patriots would need to do. Or, a t- you know, a team like that that already has a, a decent running back, maybe not a Christian McCaffrey or a Saquon Barkley, but has a good, solid running back first option, and you pick up Edward Solaire as running back 1B. I think he could excel in something like that. Um, and also, I think he doesn't get enough credit for his big play potential. He, he's not just a bowling ball. He's a bowling ball that, act, that also had, what, 36% of his carries went for first downs or touchdowns, averaged like six yards a carry. Um, he's not just a, a bowling ball that runs over people and gets tackled after three yards and just bounces off people. He had big play potential, and he played you know, out of the backfield, and people forget he also was a kick returner. Um, so we really, really, really like him. He's probably the best of the running backs that isn't a surefire starter bell cow back. Mm. One of the other advanced metrics that I like, and I, I don't, I'm not going to know this number exactly off the top of my head. I just, I know around what it was by the end of the season. And I was kind of surprised you didn't mention this one earlier, but maybe it's just like such a big, a big step up in terms of level of competition from college to the NFL that it doesn't necessarily always translate. But wasn't his broken tackle percentage by the end of the season around like fifty percent? Yeah, it was. It was pretty ridiculous. Let me see. <laughs> My SEC stats would actually have have that um, if we can find it. But he just every single play, it seems like he's breaking the tackle, and not just that. It seems like he's falling forward three yards every single play. So he had a fifty-seven percent success rate, um, which is crazy. The uh, season average for SEC running backs was about 45%. So 12% um, better than um, season average. Negative rushing percent was only 8%. uh, 8%. Zero to three yards is about 35%, which leaves 60% of his rushes went at least three yards, which is what you want. People say, okay, we want a guy that goes at least um, 
you know, at least three yards. He averaged 3.8 yards per carry after contact, mm. um, which we, again, really, really like. Um, and then 35% of his carries went for at least seven yards with 17% of those going at least 10 yards. So he's got the big play potential there. We don't really think about him having big play potential, but he does. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the things where his broken, yeah, broken tackle percentage is 47%, wow. um, which is And is, is that number so ridiculous that you say, okay, that's not going to translate to the NFL? Or is that something you look at and say, if – if this guy's actually that hard to bring down, he's just going to be that hard to bring down, and that's going to be even trouble for NFL defenders. If it's that ridiculous, you're not expecting him to break 48, you know, a tackle on 48% of his carries. But you're not expecting that to drop to 5% either. You're, you're looking at, you know, you're going to see a little bit of a drop because you're going up against NFL competition. But as we saw with the, um, defensive line, he was kind of going up against NFL competition for most of the year last year. He averaged five yards per carry after contact against Clemson of all teams. Um, and we know how good that their defensive line was and their linebacking core was last year. Um, so when we look at that, um, we look at that and say, that's ridiculous. It's not going to stay that ridiculous. Um, just kind of the same way we look at Joe Burrow's completion percentage or something like that. We know that he's not going to complete 78% of his passes in the NFL. That would just be crazy. That's not going to happen. But at the same time, if that goes down to 70%, it makes him the best in the league. Um, if it goes down to you know 68%, he's among the best in the league. And so um, what we're looking at is we really, really like guys um, that can break tackles because break tackles do, um, do translate a little bit. And then the other thing is the reason he's breaking tackles is he's not running over every guy. Um, he is running over a lot of guys, but we're also seeing him shed a bunch of arm tackles because he's a little bit quicker, a little bit shiftier than most people think expect him to be at his size. And so he's constantly raking up in the top. We just really like him. The only thing that drops his value is he's not going to be that every down guy, and you don't need an every down back in today's NFL. He's just – He's he's just one of my favorites. I loved watching him last year. I'm glad we got to spend as much time talking about him. And I'm glad that you like watching him as much as I do. He's just he's just a blast. And also, I, I like LSU, so it was fun watching him be, obviously, a, a huge part of that national championship team. Uh, we're running a little bit long here, and we got a bunch more guys to get to. So we'll run through uh, Eno Benjamin from Arizona State, Zach Moss from Utah. I know you and I both really like Utah and Zach Moss. Darren Tenevis from Appalachian State, Antonio Gibson from Memphis, and Anthony McFarland from Maryland. Do you group these next five guys together? Are they with Edwards Hilaire? Are they with some of the next five guys that we're going to see on the list? Where, where do you sort of divide these guys? Edwards Hilaire is going to be your, like, fifth guy, I think. Um, and, and, again, the only thing that's holding him back is he's not going to be an every down running back, which I don't care about personally. It's just going to drop him in the draft. Um, these guys are very interchangeable as those next five running backs. I think there's a pretty decent gap between these five guys and everybody else in the draft. Um, but they all do have their flaws in some way, um, whether it's like competition level or, or something like that. Um, so I've got, um, you know, Benjamin is my next guy. Um, I love, you know, Benjamin talking about fantasy um, two years ago as a sophomore, I picked him pretty early in our fantasy draft as kind of a, um, on a whim. Um, I play college fantasy. I prefer it. Um, and he was dominant as a sophomore. I think he ran for over 200 yards in over half of his games. Um, really good out of the backfield as far as uh, passing ball or uh, catching the ball. He's violent. He's elusive. Um, he's got really great tape, except for this year. And that's kind of what drops him is this year he just wasn't as good on tape. Um, now, when we get to the receivers, there's a reason for that. Um, there's a guy named Brandon Ayuk who kind of came out of nowhere this year as a uh, receiver that kind of became their go-to guy, and they got away from Eno Benjamin a little bit at um, Arizona State. But he's got great tape. I really, really like him, and I would expect him to be more like sophomore year than junior year in the NFL. Um, so I really like him. He does have that kind of that give you pause with his tape this year because it's just not as good. His stats aren't as good this year. Um, but I'm a big fan. He's not the fastest guy, so he's not going to pop off um, the charts from a uh, testing perspective, but I really, really like him. Um, the next guy we've got also a uh, Pac-12 guy, um, 
not Pac-12 uh, from where he's from. I always think of Utah guys being some obscure guy from, like, Idaho that went to Utah, redshirted twice, and then magically ended up somewhere. Zach Moss was a um, four-star, fringe five-star recruit. Um, his cousins, we might know him, uh, Sonoris and Santana Moss. He's from um, – he played for one of the big high schools in Florida. Um, was committed to Miami when Al Golden left. I kind of forgot Al Golden was at Miami for a while. But when Al Golden left, he decommitted and ended up going to Utah. Um, did redshirt a year. Um, but he's big. He's fast. Um, he's versatile. We really liked him as well. He's got a couple flaws here and there in his game, and he had an ankle injury last year that slowed him down. Um, but from an advanced metrics perspective, I think we talked about this last year, that he was so, so, so good. A lot of that I do think is the Pac-12 was not as good last year. They were just really not a good football conference. Um, and we, we kind of saw that a little bit later in the year when I think Oregon was the team that shut him down. Um, just uh, They put like eight, eight, nine, ten guys in the box and just dared uh, Utah to pass it on them. Um, but so he's got one or two games his um, last year that just don't look great um, on film, don't look great from a stats perspective. But a lot of that is that ankle injury. Um, I think he'll bounce back from that. I think he's a solid player in the NFL. Again, none of these guys, I don't think, uh, with a couple exceptions, are going to be future, like, you know, 30 carry game guys. But I don't think you're looking for a 30 carry the game, a game guy. I think you're looking for a guy that can touch it 20, maybe 25 times a game with five catches um, and maybe some, you know, return potential for a couple of these guys. Um, so we like him too. Uh, so we got our two Pac-12 guys, I think, as um, kind of six and seven on this list um, behind our top five. Uh, and then we have maybe my personal favorite guy in the draft as far as relative to draft position. Um, that's as of today. As of Friday, Saturday, might not be the case. Um, Darrington Evans, I watched a lot. Big App State fan. Always have been an App State fan. Um, I try to watch their games as much as possible. This guy is elite at the things that we really like. Um, best acceleration maybe in college football for a running back. Um, great one-cut potential. You're going to watch, see a lot of plays where he just kind of runs outside, picks his hole, and he's gone. Um, you know, takes one cut to the left or the right. He's not going to try to run around guys. He's not going to try to juke guys out a lot. He's going to make his one cut in the hole and just go. And we really, really, really like Jarrington Evans. Had a major leg injury. I think it was a broken leg or a, a knee injury. Actually um, ended up tripping, got caught from behind on a run against Georgia Southern um, in the rain. Um, if anybody watched that game, great game. Super cold, rainy, sleet. Um, foot got stuck, and he either broke his leg or, or tore his ACL. I can't remember. Um, that basically ended his career. But his, his senior year was – incredible up to that point. So we love uh, Jaronson Evans, too. Um, and he was a kick returner, so we like that. I think out of this next group of guys, he is your best chance to come out and be that next elite running back in the um, in the NFL. Is he behind Benjamin and Moss just because of relative level of competition? Um, a little bit, um, I think, relative level of competition. Also, one of the, I try not to go too far above expert um, picks in this. He's really, you're looking at a week ago, he was trending as like the 15th, 16th, 17th running back off the board. He's jumped up into maybe fringe top 10. I still have him above most people. Um, but saying, yeah, he's a second round guy. I try to stay away from that when most everybody's saying he's a fourth round guy. Um, but I do think that a team takes him early third round. I think he goes maybe 70th, 75th overall. I think that's actually a good range for him, and he's not tr he's trending in that direction. But every mock draft I've seen has him early fourth round at the earliest right now. I still think that he ends up in the third round just because apparently he's um, in a lot of these Skype interviews and things like that. He's really impressed teams, and really his one red flag is that leg injury mm. um, from last year. Uh, I think it's a broken leg. I'll look it up real quick. If it's a broken leg, um, we expect him to heal from that more quickly have less, um, you know, less chance of having that be a lingering injury, unlike a knee injury. Um, but, but we'll see. He also ran a 4-4-1, um, 
at the uh, the combine that's really good. Um, but uh, I think the one thing is he's kind of limited in scheme, which turns some teams off because, again, while we want teams to tailor their scheme to the running back, they're not always going to do that. But it also means that if he find, finds a good fit, he can be a really, really elite running back um, out of this class. All right, just a couple minutes left. Uh, we have Antonio Gibson and Anthony McFarland left on this first list. And on, on the second page, I'll let you just say a little bit about them because, again, we're, we're going a little long here. But Absolutely. Rico Dowdle, you have as the 13th ranked running back and had uh, you know a great senior season, best year of his career by far. How much of that was the presence of Tavian Feaster to sort of push him? How much of that is what Thomas Brown was doing as the running back coach? How much of that was just him being healthy? I was surprised to see him on this board. I, I wasn't expecting that he would get drafted. So what do you think NFL teams will see from Dowdle? So I don't necessarily find him as the 13th best. I just think relative to his current draft position, which is like fringe draft pick, um, undrafted free agent, he's got everything that NFL teams want. The injury is a concern because it's been multiple years of multiple injuries, and he's never put together a full season at running back ever because he played quarterback in high school. Uh, But he's got NFL size. He's got elite NFL vision, uh, maybe – top two or three um, as far as finding a hole, being able to squeak through smaller openings. Um, I think we talked about this uh, last year that South Carolina's running back or run blocking was not great. Their pass blocking was pretty decent. Um, As an offensive line, their run blocking was not very great. Um, But Rico Dowdle, um, and I I do think Tavian Feaster's presence there helped. Um, He really showed that he's got what NFL teams want. Um, I, I think it's, think of it as like Mike Gates. Of, we didn't expect Mike Davis to do anything in the NFL, but South Carolina running backs tend to, tend to stick around for a little bit in the NFL. I'm not expecting him to start in the NFL. I'm expecting him to be a guy that can come in if a guy's injured and you know take 20 carries a game and be fine. Um, I just don't expect him to be elite, but he's got a lot of the tools that NFL teams look for. He's got good pad level. Um, he's going to stick around if he stays healthy. The thing that I'm concerned with with Rico Dowdle is the fact that if he does get hurt, it's very easy to cut a sixth or seventh round running back because they sprained their ankle Mm. um, versus a second or third round running back that maybe had a a bigger injury, but you're going to keep him around because you drafted him early. There's just that kind of sunk cost fallacy of um, if there's not a lot of initial investment, it's a little bit easier to move on from a guy. So my concern would be Rico Dowdle having some sort of nagging injury in training camp or something like that and not getting to showcase his potential um, on an NFL roster. Well, that's a very, uh, I don't want to say a real reality because that's redundant and stupid, but Carolina fans know exactly what that looks like to have a guy with that kind of ability. You saw it freshman year, you saw it in, in flashes of senior year, but when you're not able to stay healthy, I mean, that's that's a huge part of the consideration. And, and unfortunately, uh, probably one of the, the biggest red flags you can have, especially at a position that's already not one that, that's got a lot of value. Um, all right, there's a couple other guys we didn't get a chance to uh, to get to today. Uh, Will, I think you're going to release your entire position group list via the Draft Network on Twitter uh, once we get a little bit closer to the draft. So y'all be tuned in to Will's Twitter page, at WHelms21, if you want to see the complete list. Uh, I, I'm glad that we had such a good and productive running back about or conversation about running backs today, considering... Uh, they're just a really, I don't want to say underutilized, but not not the most valuable position on offense right now in the NFL. I'll just say it like that. So I, I appreciate your insights as always. Y'all be sure to check out his Twitch. It's prep underscore RA. Is that correct? Yes. Prep underscore RA on Twitch. Uh, if you want to join Will as he sort of breaks down film to see how he, how he does it, if it's just a, an interest of yours, if you're trying to find some entertainment, just want to watch some football, or if you're someone that's interested in how people break down film, it's a great way to get some insight into that. So prep underscore RA. And again, stay tuned to his Twitter to find out when exactly he's going to be going live on Twitch. And as always, still no school, but you can still get tutoring. You can still get all the great benefits of prep RA, prep-ra.com. If you are or know someone that wants to be a student athlete at the next level and you need SAT or ACT prep, private group tutoring, subject tutoring, college prep, recruiting guidance, social media workshops, essay editing, all that stuff, prep-ra.com. Well, you're incredibly busy. I don't know how you have like a normal life when we're not in quarantine because it seems like your schedule is completely full with nothing else going on. 
but it's impressive. Well, uh, try to stay busy, but <laughs> we'll see uh, what happens after all of this. Yeah. All right. Well, very good. Well, we'll, uh, we'll be back uh, later this week because we missed last week. We're going to do linebackers next. So go to a little back and forth offense, defense, offense, defense. So check out prep-ra.com. Follow Will on Twitter at WHelms21. Prep underscore RA for his Twitch. Uh, Will Helms is providing all the content you need during quarantine. So, Will, thank you so much. And thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe to this and everything on the Gamecock Central Podcast Network. And we'll talk to you later this week.